day of uh, the conference. Oh, sad face. Um, so our first speaker for this session is Michael Bright. He's going to be talking about Jupiter for everything else. Thank you. So Jupiter for everything else seemed like an arrogant title to me, but at the end of the day, it's just this premise that you don't actually have to be an astrophysicist to, to use Jupiter. There are many other uses. And uh, so one of them is actually command line. Uh, I found quite a few uses just using command line. So I hope even the astrophysicists will find something interesting to take away from this talk. Uh, this isn't what I do at work either. So I'm a Brit who, I did my Brexit in the other sense 24 years ago. I live in Grenoble in France. Uh, and I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. What I'm showing is nothing to do with my work, though when I can, I do slide Jupiter in there for some things. And I also run a Python user group in Grenoble. So uh, if any of you pass by Grenoble and want to present, you'll be more than welcome. Uh, people will be, will be glad to see something other than my uh, beta uh, talks, of, uh, <laughs> conference talks. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about IPython and Jupiter themselves. Sometimes it's not that clear um, of the difference between them, given the, the big split. Um, look at the Jupiter project and the ecosystem, because I figure if you're going to call it Jupiter for everything else, you have to look a bit at the existing stuff. And there's a lot of stuff in the Jupiter universe. And then I'll get on to some of the things that I've been playing with, uh, so Jupiter for everything else. Okay, so it all started out with this afternoon hack in 2001 by uh, Fernando Perez, who basically wanted something to help scientists in this exploration process where you do some work individually, then you share it with, with colleagues. When you get to a certain point, you want to uh, maybe test that on a production system um, and then publicize, and then eventually when your work becomes established, then educate people, and he wanted to start something that would help with that exploration loop and the publication associated with that. And so in an afternoon, he wrote this thing, 259 lines of, of Python, the IPython interpreter. It was just a console application. Uh, actually, this screenshot isn't that. Uh, this is the latest version, I, IPython 5, which came out uh, just a week or two ago. Uh, but the basic idea there is the same of a text-based console, um, a read-eval read print loop with a series of input and output cells, history, and also uh, external plotting capabilities. That was the beginning. And then in 2014 at SciPy, uh, they announced the big split. At that point, everything on this slide existed and was called IPython, okay? And IPython had grown into this thing where the actual interpreter was the IPython kernel or other language kernels, which were fronting, um, fronted by these console or Qt console or what was then called the IPython notebook. Uh, so that was all Python and it was multi-language and it was kind of difficult to go along and say, hey, you know, you want to do Haskell, Julia, R, use the IPython notebook. Didn't quite make sense. So the big split was partly a naming exercise, becomes Jupyter. Jupyter because the principal languages proposed were Julia, Python, and R. Um, but as we'll see, there are many languages available. Um, and so now, uh, when we talk about IPython, we're in fact talking about just that uh, top left ellipse there, the IPython kernel. Okay, so we have the IPython kernel or a whole host of other language kernels that can work with the front ends on the right, and they are all part of the Jupyter project. Jupyter project represents everything that is language agnostic. Okay, so the notebook, I guess people know a bit the notebook, but uh, again, it's the same concept of um, read event print loop that extended to the, the browser where we now have rich media in a web page. So we can have a mix of markdown cells, uh, input 
code cells, um, their output, and the output itself can be uh, rich media being itself, uh, HTML, everything that's associated with that, so JavaScript, CSS, SVG. It can be hypertext links, it can be an iframe embedding a web page, it can be an audio player, which you see there, or even a YouTube video. Personally, I mean, why did I do this talk? It's because I really like the notebook concept. I like that you de uh, develop a narrative in your notebook. It's not something that you would generally use for developing code, that you can do. Uh, the risk is that it's very incremental, and so you, know, you miss the, uh, the design stage, which is important. But nevertheless, for exploratory work, it's a really nice environment. And we'll see, I, I've been using it actually for running demos or uh, for developing a lab. For developing a lab, it's very nice. So you have a, a preset series of steps. Even if the lab itself is not run in the notebook, but it could be, at least you have a way of validating your documentation of the lab. Okay, so narrative is a very important, uh, important element. Uh, there are many public notebooks. I have no idea how many there are. Um, apparently, there are more than 200,000 on GitHub. And GitHub, um, <laughs> since May last year, uh, they will render uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are actually in a JSON format, so it's not something that's obvious that GitHub should be able to render. But that is the case. And there are several sites, several galleries, where you can look at existing notebooks. Um, I, shall, I like this last one. Not sure if I can go there. OK. Uh, well, the, razor, the network is working well. Um, I, I like this site because you can look at the most recent notebooks. We can see yesterday there were about six new notebooks added to this repository. And we can also see the, the most viewed. So just to say there are many resources for viewing notebooks online. These, of course, are just static notebooks, not notebooks that you can run. Okay. Nevertheless, there are um, cloud-hosted uh, environments where you can run notebooks. I wanted to just mention um, some of the big cloud providers now. So uh, Microsoft with Azure Machine Learning Studio, uh, Google with their Data Lab, and IBM Data Scientist, they're all providing online environments where Jupyter is integrated into their data science labs. So I think that speaks a lot for um, how the community is building upon Jupyter. Uh, otherwise, there are also another couple of cloud-hosted options, uh, TriJupyter um, and Binder. I think I have a slide on... Oh, OK. I've got one first on the Azure... ML Studio, so this is Microsoft Machine Learning Studio environment. Uh, they provided initially Python as a language in that, and they more recently added, I think in March, they added R as well. It's still early days for that, but uh, they seem to have serious plans for the use of Jupyter in their environment. Okay, TriJupyter is actually a Rackspace hosted um, environment. They're using... Um, say, a, a, a Docker demo image, which has a set of language kernels already installed. Uh, not just languages, this one actually includes the Apache Spark environment. Um, I can see there are example notebooks, welcome to Spark with Python and Scala. Uh, there are also Bash, Haskell, uh, Julia, uh, R and Ruby kernels there. So that's just an ephemeral instance uh, you go to tryjupiter.org, you will get this dashboard and these notebooks of these languages available to play with. I will talk later about Binder and how I've been using that, which also provides ephemeral instances. Okay, so just to talk about the Jupyter project itself, uh, some of the components of that. So the notebook runs in the browser. Uh, it has its notebook server, which is written in Python, itself and has many HTML JavaScript elements associated and behind it we have a language kernel whether it be Python, Ruby or whatever. And the project includes so language kernels, uh, widgets, uh, so things like uh, ability to have drop-down boxes, menus and stuff, 
uh, within the notebook um, and then language kernels. So we look at the kernels. So there are about 50 kernels available. This list prob probably isn't up to date. Uh, I should say, though, your mileage might vary. Um, I've tried a few. Well, I'm, I'm running Windows here, so it's my own fault. But uh, some of those things can be quite tricky to install. Some are uh, incredibly easy to install. Uh, I think I have installed and working the Metakernel Bash. I have some Callisto Prolog, Callisto Scheme, uh, Conch, which is a, a sort of Unix Python shell that was announced at uh, PyCon a few weeks ago. Uh, what else? Python, of course. But there's, there really are a lot of languages code there. Okay, extensions. There are a lot of notebook extensions. I'm not going to go into detail about those. I'll just mention some that I find of particular interest. So RISE, uh, I'm running RISE now. So this presentation is actually running in a Jupyter notebook. And there is this <coughs> RISE extension which allows you to run a reveal.js presentation from within the notebook. Uh, there's also NB Presenter. I only discovered this last week. That's, that's what I love about Jupyter. Um, you know, your presentations already, and then you discover oh, another amazing extension. So NB Presenter is produced by the guys who produce Anaconda, um, Continuum IO. Um, and it's another way of doing uh, slideshows within Jupyter. I've installed that, but haven't dared use it, use it for the conference. I was too frightened of breaking uh, my existing slideshow. Uh, NBGrader, I mean, there are hundreds of extensions. These are just ones I find of particular interest. Uh, NBGrader is something that can be used in, platform, in classrooms. Um, uh, there's a thing called Jupyter Hub, which allows you to have a multi-user server serving up... Um, notebooks, different users in the classroom setting. And MBGrader is an extension which allows you to set an assignment. Uh, cells will be uh, defined as automatically graded or manually graded. How many points are associated with a particular ta part of an assignment? So that's quite an interesting development. Okay. If we look at uh, the ecosystem and some of the future projects, So some of the more interesting ones are Spark Magic. Um, so we've seen on the Tri Jupiter, there's already a Spark integrated into that image. But that is, it's Spark integrated into the image. In general, when you want to do some real data analysis with Spark, you're going to want to have something, um, a real Spark backend externally. So Spark Magic is a project to allow that, <coughs> a standard way to integrate into external uh, Spark environments. So I can imagine with Azure ML, for example, they will no doubt use that to integrate uh, with their own Spark. Declarative widgets. I mentioned widgets, drop-down menus, and so on. Today, we can use IPython widgets, but that's Python-specific. It's in the IPython kernel. Uh, declarative widgets will allow to define menus, drop-down bo drop boxes, and so on within the HTML, which can then be more easily in integrated in the different language kernels. Uh, dashboards, we'll show you in just a moment. Content management, there's a lot of work on looking at uh, how we can import a notebook as a module. Okay? Today, a, mod a notebook is standalone. That's what you get. But there's work looking at how to um, bundle a notebook with other dependent files, uh, import notebooks as a module or as a cookbook and also do uh, things like uh, tables of contents. There's also the kernel gateway project, which will basically allow non-notebook clients, so basically any web front end, for example, <coughs> to integrate elements of Jupyter. Um, so I have an example of something similar in a moment, where O'Reilly um, have integrated cells of a notebook into a blog post. Okay, so I'll just show one of those incubator projects. Um, this one is already uh, available. You can pip install it. I've not actually done that yet. Um, I think it's in its 0 0.6 release, something like that. And the idea is 
uh, being able to move away from that linear notebook uh, concept and to be able to arrange your cells into a grid as you would want to do something uh, which you want to use as a dashboard. Uh, this isn't an incubating project as such, but it's up and coming. So I think it was last week uh, it was announced as a pre-alpha uh, Jupyter Lab. Uh, Jupyter Lab will be the new interface. So um, the interface I showed for TriJupyter, I was showing the dashboard. In the future, this Jupyter Lab will be the standard interface where we will have the same um, possibility of having sort of a list of files and folders. Um, opening a terminal, opening notebooks, opening notebooks in different tabs. Uh, you can see that it's quite a dynamic environment. Uh, it's only, it's a pip install away. It seems pretty stable. Um, actually, it seems totally stable from what I've seen. Uh, but it is pre-alpha, so you don't have the same functionality yet. But that's pretty nice. Uh, personally, as I've done uh, demos using the notebook, um, I like running demos in the notebook and everything is, you know, controlled, you know. Um, but it's nice as well to be able to pop out into a terminal. And I, I like it, the Jupyter Lab environment, I'll be able to have my, my notebook running and in the same window, a terminal, to see what's going on. Okay, so I was just to give an idea about uh, things that are happening in the Jupyter project. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff especially on the user interface side of things. Um, I'll just mention that there are a lot of uh, uh, projects using Jupyter uh, for blogging. There have been examples of Nature and Scientific American um, doing blog posts or people doing complete books. Uh, I think it's Python for data analysis is available um, as a complete set of Python notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. Um, and in education, there are various uh, MOOCs, online courses, that are using uh, Jupyter Online. Okay, and I, I just mentioned that uh, O'Reilly blog article. Um, actually, I've been having trouble running it recently, um, but the idea is it, it's just a standard blog. Uh, looks like any other blog page on the O'Reilly site. Um, but within the article, they have these uh, blackened out cells on the right, and you can't see it, but there's actually a, a run button bottom right. And so as you read the blog article, you press run, and that's going to launch actually a Docker container um, running um, a Jupyter note Notebook instance. And you can actually run, but obviously modify the code as you go. Okay, so if I look at what I've been doing with uh, Jupyter, everything else. Um, of course, with Jupyter, as I say, you have this uh, rich media through, through Markdown or through code. You can inject HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SVG into your notebook. It's a very rich environment. Um, I've been looking at the use of the bash kernel for command line work. Why not? Um, and then I, I, I wanted to see, well, I like, the idea, I like the idea of having um, a Unix shell as a first-class citizen itself. You know, why shouldn't you just be able to do command line stuff as well in the notebook? Um, but why not supplement it as well with, with graphics? I've been playing with, with that a bit. Uh, you could say why, of course, um, because you could just do Python and then escape out into Bash. Um, well, there are several reasons. For one, escaping out into Bash uh, can be slow. You're launching a subprocess, and there's no persistence uh, between uh, cells when you do that. <coughs> um, but the, the other reason was I felt, well, I want to do a tutorial, for example, which is command line stuff. Um, I want it to look just like the shell, and then with the graphics as well. But I don't want to be breaking out into magics. Okay. Uh, I've been looking at, um, so I mentioned the RISE extension I'm running here. I've been looking at uh, publishing live blog posts. In fact, um, well, it's not quite that. People are using Jupyter to create blog posts. That's not what I've been doing. I've been doing blogging 
and then linking to a server binder where you can run a live instance of a tutorial. And I find that pretty cool. And then another thing I've been doing uh, is being uh, at work. Uh, so I work in telecom. We manage uh, about six uh, OpenStack platforms. Uh, OpenStack is a cloud management platform. And each of those systems is between probably about 8 and 30 physical nodes. So there's a lot can, that can go wrong. Uh, so I just, um, I've done some just simple stuff under Cron, just monitoring a bit those systems. Um, I'm not saying that is how you should manage those systems. It was just some play, quick and dirty. And I decided to extend that and thought, well, why not use the notebook? Um, I saw people were talking on the mailing list about using a facility called NV Convert. Um, so I gave that a shot. So we'll look at that as well. Okay. I won't talk much about um, the web technologies as such. I'll, I'll look at it um, within um, my command line stuff. Just one thing I'll say is, I mean, you have access to the browser. So you, you have enough rope to hang yourself by. Um, I won't hang myself with this normally. But just here's an example where I can... I can't see very well, but I changed the theme of my presentation. So that's just a bit of JavaScript, a bit of CSS, HTML, and you have uh, full access. But you can do lots of things that will uh, break your notebook if you, uh, if you play too much with CSS. Okay, so looking at what I've been do doing with the command line, um, there are actually two bash kernels available, um, and I went for this one. Um, the a GitHub account, Callisto, and they've got a, a set of meta kernels. And I like these basically because, well, first of all, I could get it working on my Windows with just a, a one-line fix, um, but also because they have a family of meta kernels. The idea was um, there are magics in IPython, but those are specific to the IPython kernel. And here there are a set of magics that are available for all their kernels. Uh, so I mentioned that... I have the scheme, the prologue, another thing called coconut, I think. Um, a set of kernels that have the same common magic, so I like that. And it's also on the active development. So why? Well, floats my boat. Uh, as I said, I, I started out actually doing some demos. I was actually doing some Docker demos uh, at work, doing presentations and then demo. I started out doing them in Python, escaping into Bash. Not very nice started doing them in command line. And then also I, I ran a Docker build lab uh, in February. And so I developed the whole lab in a notebook. And that was, that was pretty nice because uh, I, was, I was pretty late preparing. And at times when you've changed things, you know, make sure everything works, it's nice to be able to, ju to just run all. And your whole lab just runs from start to finish. And then you can see if there are any problems. Um, okay, and I wanted to look at um, can I make Bash a sort of first-class notebook citizen and adding some magics. Okay. And as we've seen in a moment, I, I, I looked at some command line tutorials which I blogged about and that you can run live on, on Binder. So let me just, um, just go to an example notebook of some of the things I've been playing around with in Bash. Hopefully this is stable, it wasn't quite the case uh, yesterday. But <laughs> um, Okay, so I just wanted to play around with the different things, HTML, JavaScript, and so on, uh, see how I could make some of those things available in Bash. Uh, the, these first examples might seem like a waste of time, um, but just showing you can do it, you can echo some HTML into this bash function I created, and it will actually be rendered as HTML. Uh, so the principle was not to use the magics, which I could have used, um, but to be able to really stay in the bash paradigm. Okay, similarly, oops, I can create a, an HTML table. Okay, a more practical example. So a work, okay, this is an example of running a, the OpenStack command line client and seeing uh, 
couple of VMs that are running. So I captured that. Although I'm connected to work, I wasn't going to depend on the, the network connection. So I can echo that same text, pipe it through this thing, HTML table, and display it as HTML. OK, nothing amazing. Then if I define a function, highlight, say I want to highlight all the VMs, or actually all of them are active there, um, then I can do that same, same pipeline, deciding to, to highlight the active stuff, or, or whatever. OK, so it's not rocket science. But the, there could be uses for that. Um, let me just give them that. Uh, or similarly, just doing some uh, basic stuff. I don't know why that was empty. OK, curious. Oh, OK, sorry. That was just function definition. So I just defined a function, uh, HTML find, just to be able to output the results of that uh, as an HTML table. Again, it, it's nothing, nothing amazing in itself. OK. Uh, one of the magics available in the metakernel bash uh, is this thing, percent percent dot. It's basically uh, graph view uh, graphics. So it allows you, this is uh, line magic, where you can just create a, a graph on the fly. So I wanted to, I wanted to create a, a bash function to be able to do the same thing. OK. Um, so it's really just playing, seeing how you can make something which is essentially command line, make it more visible if you want to run a tutorial. Some other examples. And this one, do I display it? OK. In this one, all I'm doing here is just creating a file hierarchy, and then I created a function to display that graphically, ah, which is broken. OK, never mind. Oh. Sorry. No, it isn't broken. I'm broken. Try again. OK, there you go. So n nothing amazing. Just, just trying to mix the paradigms again. I can do just basic JavaScript, do a pop-up. Amazing. I'll skip the Python one. Just go piping Python into Python from Bash. Bash is a bit weird. I don't have a use case for that one. Um, I did uh, an example of just uh, doing some graphics with D3GS. Uh, not very pretty, but I just wanted to push, see what I could do. Uh, this is fairly empty example really, but I'm actually calling Lightning. Lightning is a, a graphics library with a publicly hosted server. So the content of this is just uh, not something useful, I'm afraid, but uh, it was just to show the example. Similarly, I did the same sort of thing with uh, Bokeh. Okay, that actually... No. The intention would be to create a minimal API around um, a bash function to invoke Bokeh. Um, so I've done some stuff like converting CSV files into HTML and this sort of thing. Uh, I'd like to do the same thing of doing CSV to Bokeh and then maybe with a you know, minus pie chart, minus bar chart, this sort of option. Okay, I literally copied some um, some code from the other bash kernel uh, done by someone from the Jupyter team just to be able to do image display. And all my functions, I tried to make them work in different ways of uh, display of a file name, uh, display on standard input. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip the SVG. It's just some magic. Okay, that of code. Um, Okay, I mentioned, so I, I wrote some Python. Uh, so here it's just in the cell just to show you uh, that would do conversion from a CSV file to HTML. See what I could do with that. So, so here I'm just using a, a DU, taking the first five lines, just to see what we get. Uh, doing that with the minus H human option. 
then sorting that. Okay, so we got the largest files first, 210 megabytes for demos directory. And now I'm going to pipe it into that Python script. Uh, okay, and this will output HTML. I'm, do I'm doing a head just to take the beginning so you can see that it constructs the HTML. Now I'll do the same thing, but piping it into the HTML function. Okay, so you know that's very much in the Unix command line spirit of piping stuff into into different functions. Um, okay, I'm going to skip the rest because I. Okay, uh, there was a, one other thing uh, I did because I started to do just you know like lists of files and this sort of thing. Um, I thought it could be interesting. It reminded me of a project called XML Term in the days of my youth. Well, actually, I wasn't that young, but uh, back in 2000, this was like pre-Firefox. <coughs> Mozilla was the browser. And some guy added this capability called XML Term, and well, basically it allowed you within the browser to have a command line interface, and it would do things like thumbnails and so on. Um, and you could, it would actually have utilities which communicate XML, and I believed in XML at the time. I thought this was going to be really great, but unfortunately, Mozilla was a was a big thing, and uh, it's a good thing that it got uh, replaced by a Firefox, and so it got um, it, it got cold. Nothing ever became of it. I was surprised a few years ago to come across a thing called GraphTerm. Um, actually developed by the same guy, so this time it was uh, all in Python. So I was just wondering, well, can I do something similar? Okay, so I created a function XLS. Actually, that's a tribute to uh, XML term because he had a function called XLS. And so the idea was, it's a bit slow because there's a lot of rendering, but it will look at different files in the directory and it will render them in different ways. So folder icons and folder, uh, Jupyter icon, for notebooks, uh, the CSV, it's rendered as an HTML table. A Docker file is a, is a nice whale. Okay. So I had fun with that. Personally, what I find more interesting is Binder. Uh, so Binder is a resource that for the moment is free, so I shouldn't be talking to you about it because if everyone runs out and uses it, then... Maybe it won't be free anymore. This is the interface to Binder. Basically, you give it the URL of a GitHub repository. It will look to see if there's a Docker file, and it will build a Docker image corresponding. Uh, if there isn't, then it will look for a pip requirements file or a conda uh, YAML file. But basically, it will, on the fl well, it will build an, a Docker image and then you or anyone else, if you share the link with them, um, will be able to, to run instances of that environment. So you have instant runnable environments that have all the dependencies necessary for running a Jupyter notebook. So let me see. Uh, here's an example. Actually, this example is the dashboard when you give it a, a repository. This is actually my GitHub repo, which has this presentation in it. Uh, so if I, uh, if I click on launch here, which is rather daring mid-conference, um, it will actually launch an instance of um, the Docker image that I'd already built from, from my GitHub repo. Okay, so in the dashboard, and I can actually go... Okay, I was just hoping for one thing, that I would have the icon of the RISE presentation. Okay, there you go. This is the icon to go into the slideshow mode. Okay, and that is my presentation at this time running out in the cloud on Binder. So I find Binder really cool. I'll kill that. That too. Um... 
but more interesting for me. Uh, so I created a GitHub repo with some command line tutorials, um, and I linked to that. So we go to that GitHub repo. Basically, uh, when you build an image on Binder, they, they propose that you put this uh, launch Binder icon on there, and if you click on that, it will take you an, to an image running that repository. So again, this is uh, live in the cloud. So I, there I just um, initially, uh, so I blog posted, and I thought, well, I'll do loads of these before EuroPython. Great. And so I thought, well, I'll start at the bottom. I did a, an LS tutorial. Yes. And it took me another two months to get around to doing anything else. But thankfully, I did. Uh, a week or so ago, uh, I added a few, a few ones. So especially for you, I added a Perl 6 one-liner tutorial. Uh, it's just a shell, just an idea. But now something more interesting. Uh, so here, this is an index page, the different tutorials I created. And one of them, uh, I like the idea quite a bit. So I did uh, a TCP dump tutorial. It's pretty short, but you know, just get the idea. Um, so I always start off by uh, just doing a check of what environment we're running. Uh, and so running the first cell, we can see that uh, we're running a, a Debian, Debian Jesse. So this is running on, on Binder. Uh, what uh, bash version we're running, what TCP dump version we're running. Now, we're not going to be capturing with TCP dump out there in the cloud. We, we probably could do if I wanted to. I, I'd have to do things in the Docker file to enable that. But it's more interesting in the tutorial anyway to have... Um, um, a pre-captured file and go through that. So I describe in the markdown how you would capture your own packets. Uh, and then we see I have three examples of packet capture files. And we can rerun the code to look at those. So let's say I want to look at just the first two examples. I put a minus C2 in there. I rerun and we can see that. Ah, no such file or directory. Yeah, well, if you try and type at conferences. This happens, you know. Okay, if I put that in the right order, you can see, okay, it shows just the first two. So the point I'm trying to say is, you know, this is a live tutorial. I linked to it from my blog, and anyone can run that and play with something like TCP dump in the notebook environment. I find that, uh, I, I like that concept, I really do. Um, okay, let's get through. Uh, so I've talked about RISE uh, for doing slideshows. I won't go into more detail on that here. Uh, something else I did then, as I mentioned, we manage about six OpenStack platforms, and uh, four of them, um, I basically int I wanted to look at managing them, uh, see how they're doing for disk space and so on. Uh, it's actually after seeing someone talk about NB convert on the Jupyter mailing list. I uh, thought, oh, I'll give that a try. With NB convert, it can execute a notebook, um, and it can obviously convert to another format. So you can call it from cron. So I have a cron job that nightly uh, runs a notebook under cron, converts it to HTML, and then I send that HTML to me as email. Now, there were several problems along the way. I thought, great, okay, and now I'll supplement it with graphics, except that um, email readers will um, render HTML, but they won't render graphics unless it's actually a, um, a link to an actual external uh, graphics file. Um, but I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll try CSS, so I developed some CSS stuff, and ah, they, don't, uh, they won't do the animation of CSS either. And uh, same thing with, obviously, with JavaScript uh, and even SVG. So, okay, never mind. So I looked at what I could do, and obviously HTML tables. Um, so if I look at, okay, here we have uh, a live example. I'm actually going to clear all the output and rerun this. The idea is, okay, I developed this in the notebook, then periodically abstracted stuff out so that the 
there would be relatively little code showing in the notebook, as this will end up in an, in an email. Um, well, let me just. And initially, I did these basically one per platform. I know to create HTML tables showing the status. Uh, this is physical nodes, if they respond to ping. This is the VMs, are they active or not? This is checking whether ports are open, and this is checking some of the API endpoints. And then I was also getting some disk uses stuff. That one I've actually abandoned because um, at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, you want a dashboard. You want something that will give you a heads up. Is everything okay, please? So I basically refactored it. I'm going to run all that now. <coughs> it's a bit slow. Oops. Okay, run all. Okay, so this is connected to our lab in Grenoble. Um, I mean, this is just showing the progress. It's sort of pinging physical nodes. And it will go through the four platforms. Uh, at one point, when I wanted to do an initial status um, table at the top for the multiple platforms, I thought, well, hey, yeah, with uh, the notebook and do some JavaScript and just insert that up in the top of the notebook. But I forgot, of course, that uh, that won't be rendered in my HTML email. So I just had to refactor the code. And each time I got a platform status, I'd return some status codes to me and the HTML. And then afterwards, uh, once all the status have been done, so I'm just coming through to the fourth platform now, um, I have another cell where I construct a table of the overall status of the different platforms, and then I loop through the different platforms, <coughs> pre printing the HTML detail of what happened. Okay, I'll just let that finish. How am I doing for time? Okay. Okay, so very quickly. Um, so I get this platform status summary, and of course it's some HTML, so I can link, link through. So if I look at the second line there, um, a platform, platform called NFE5, what I've done is I've shown on the right the status of the ports and so on, everything's fine, but we can see here the disk usage. But this platform has about, I don't know, 30-odd physical nodes, and this is the node which has the worst case disk usage. So if I link down to that platform, see those details on the disk space, so I've ordered the disk space of lots of the different nodes. Uh, so this one was the worst one. And here I've built a bar graph showing the trend over the last uh, 10 days or so. Uh, so at the end of the day, disk space is high as a problem. What's worse is if it's going up like 10% a day and so on. Okay, so I just wanted to show that as an example of how we can use MB Convert um, to do status reports. I'm not saying this is the way I should monitor our platforms, but it was more of an experiment uh, with Jupyter. Okay, and this is the, the sort of command that I used. Another little gotcha with it uh, was with Gmail in particular. Um, it would clip the message saying I would have to go on another link. Uh, basically, the standard template used, there's too much CSS and so on. Um, and so using template basic, you can cut down the, the, the HTML file size. Okay, so to finish off, um, I'd like to go further with this using uh, Jupyter Hub and MBGrader, trying to do some um, online, um, so classroom type labs. Um, experiment more with the metakernel bash stuff. I'd like to um, have a more sort of consistent API set of functions that can use so I can do things like bokeh graphics and so on but from some real data. Uh, I want to do some pull requests against the metakernel bash. I'm out on the limb at the moment. Um, propose this stuff outside the Python community. Well, actually, uh, it got rejected for Linux Con Europe. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's fine. There's this conch kernel I mentioned. I'd like to take a look at that, though I suspect it will be a weird mix of command line and Python. It's probably not what I'm looking for. And also look at there's a C++ interpreter kernel, which has a, a 
um, as a kernel for the notebook. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. I think I ran over. Uh. <laughs>